And while you are living a good and free life, let it be rooted in greater principles. And even from a scientific perspective, God is still applicable. The science community would call this nature and constantly marveling at the wonders and intelligence of nature. And that's what I'm talking about when I say God. The intelligent order and design in the fabric of this realm. And I think everybody can see proof of this and come to an agreement, whatever your faith or lack of it. But this higher structure should be the principles upon which we base our lives. And it seems like the power structure in place does everything it can to undermine this natural order. Welcome. And I want to open up with this little rainstorm. And while speaking of God, does he move in a cloud? As we're told in the Bible. Is weather natural? Or is there something else going on here? This seems like the keepers of the realm doing their gardening and being a little messy on this particular day. Perhaps performing their task in haste, close to retirement. Very interesting what a time lapse provides for us. What otherwise may have occurred in what would seem like slow motion, frozen in time. And how much water can a cloud actually hold? This cloud seeming to hold a pond's worth. In this little part, I just want to show you five short films. I recently talked about the removal of a building that I visited here in Salt Lake. And if you remember in the last video, I was speaking to some police officers and they told me they moved the building across the street. And I had no reason to suspect anything other in this particular case. And sure enough, I jumped online. It happened about nine years ago. And I'm very impressed with this restoration. They literally built some giant floor dollies for this thing. It looks like they bricked up all the windows to facilitate the move and give some extra strength to the structure. And we had once seen depictions of photos at the San Francisco World's Fair, where they had not only moved the building, but said to have floated it across a portion of water and set it at its new destination. In that case, I felt like the photos were very manipulated, but here, not only transporting this building across the street, but flipping it 180 degrees. And I have no doubt in our ability to do amazing things today. Sometimes I think I don't stress that enough. I think we also have the ability to replicate many of these fine wonders of the past. What I'm typically stressing is the inability for people to do this in the early time period, we're told. Not only excavating these sites, clearing out all the dirt, oftentimes digging holes, several stories, underground, with nothing more than horse and wagon. An entire realm being created before the Industrial Revolution and before electricity and the wide distribution of it. Again, many people thought that this was false information and it's nice to get to the bottom of it. 
and also nice to see something positive for once rather than the demolition and it was planned for demolition and instead was moved at a cost of six million dollars and although I've presented my theory so many times I thought I would present it in 30 seconds it seems like this past civilization may have come from either Atlantis, Lemuria, or Tartaria, as we so generically call it. A past and great civilization that rose to greatness and was wiped out. Because all the architecture and doorways and sculptures were massive, we tend to believe that these may have been giants, or just a people larger than us. There was a cataclysmic reset that wiped most everything out, and yet pockets of people and architecture and animals and massive trees survived. I think people in this past great civilization would have survived this cataclysmic event, and I think they may have something to do with our repopulating and perhaps genetically modifying us, being in their image but a little smaller. I think we were genetically engineered, populated, and distributed throughout the realm via orphan trains and many other modes that I believe are false histories. I think this same genetic race may have been used twice already in two different resets. We see reset evidence of giants and we also see reset evidence of architecture that is much smaller but clearly from a past civilization, including such things as trains and infrastructure that are made for people of our stature. I think the controllers of this realm, which are similar to ourselves, were put in place by the true controllers of this realm, who to me are unknown, and perhaps are giants living beyond this realm. I have no doubt if there's another reset they will repopulate and restructure the narrative and the timeline to suit the people. And that was in response to Matt's video. And how could we not touch on the demolition of buildings? It's one thing to build a building in this time period. And a lot of people don't consider the fact that just looking at these demolitions will show us how primitive these people really are. Typically, to deconstruct a building would require many of the same means as used in construction. And yet, in this time period, everything is done by hand, with horse and wagon. And I'm not sure how many days this time lapse may have been. And we'll notice at the end here a massive hull, because these people just continued taking brick by brick apart, and what they found is the buildings just kept going underground. And it seems like I just go on and on about this city of Salt Lake. I'm not sure sometimes if I'm getting any closer to presenting some kind of proof that the story we're given is a complete falsity. A city created in 1847 by 148 people, in 1850, 6,000, and in 1870, the railroad comes in and we have a whopping 12,000 people. Ten years later, about 20,000. And this is the approximate period I want to focus on today. 30 years. In the first 30 years, we are said to have 20,000 people. And what can a people accomplish in 30 years? We have to take into account the means, of course, available to people in this time period. Horse and wagon and the introduction of the train. We're told almost immediately in 1853, construction begins on the temple and we see a series of suspicious-looking photographs showing a massive wall 
already in place, and the Tabernacle Hall already built in the early stages of the supposed temple construction. And that would be amazing enough if we were to accept that. But at the same time, we're told they're building prisons that resemble castles, hotels, town halls, municipality buildings, industrial, universities, and places of worship for other religions, all within the first 30 years, and with a small population of less than 20,000 people. And so this brought me to the National Register of Historic Places, and I quickly became overwhelmed. The amount of historic buildings built in this early time period for a people that were told just trekked across the wilderness with oxen and horse and some even on foot is completely astounding and in my opinion completely unrealistic. Many of these have very vague construction dates and stories seemingly written in haste and I'm always impressed with how late in the game they are to add these to the historic registry some as late as 2013 but I am very thankful in many cases such as the prison built in the 1850s and demolished in the 1950s before any thought of historical preservation would begin to take place. And it seems like it was easy to manipulate history all the way up until the 1950s. And here we see a picture of the Hotel Utah in 1925, now called the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, and we're told it was built in two years, from 1909 to 1911. And here, for example, the Salt Lake County Building, one of my favorites, we are told is built in three years, from 1891 to 1894. And this thing is nothing short of the most glorious castle, complete with gargoyles and everything gothic. Here we see a beautiful castle, Converse Hall, that was built out of red brick and white stone, and was the first building erected for the college in 1906 seeming to have been built in one year. And here the old Danes Jewelry Building, built in two years of red brick, 1887 to 1889. And really, I could just go on and on and on and on. Really, I've shown it in past videos. The whole city completely built out only 30 years after the arrival of these Mormon pioneers very similar to the miners of San Francisco between 1849 and 1870, completely elegant and exquisite architecture sprouting up overnight. And it's not just all of these buildings in Salt Lake City. You have Provo, they're building temples in St. George, all throughout the state, really, all in this beautiful style. And within this lot of 20,000 people, like I said, we have Catholic churches, Greek Orthodox churches, with domes and spires and columns, not to mention a sophisticated infrastructure and rail lines. And I think you get my point. A city for the taking. And here I was just watching something that was shared with me featuring Jerry Seinfeld and it had to do with the Coney Island infant incubators and the interviewer asks him about his history and he says his father was an incubator baby and the interviewer laughs as if he doesn't believe him and I'm gonna play that for you. In the early 1900s, my dad was an incubator baby. And, and very strange. Of course, we've talked about this before. But in short, between 1854 and 1929, 
the relocating of about 200,000 orphaned, abandoned, abused, or homeless children took place. It's a very sad story, something in between acting as if they're doing a noble thing for these children, and at the same time benefiting the needs for labor, for farmers, and even for the railroads. Here they're showing us advertisements placed in papers encouraging the adoption of children. Here we can see a poster. A number of children brought from New York are still without homes. Please call and see them. And often they were treated like farm animals. Their teeth were inspected. They were made to do push-ups and other tests of fitness. This program originally said to be started by this man, Charles Loring Brace, and we're told in the 1850s there was up to 30,000 homeless children in New York City, and New York City's population at the time was 500,000. And this guy has this great idea to start shipping them across the country. In this early time period, some cities barely even getting started, barely laying the tracks to these supposed newly constructed cities. We're told these children were often known as street Arabs. Grace believed that street children would have better lives if they left the poverty of New York City and were instead raised by morally upright farm families. And in short, these children were ultimately slaves, not sold for the love and care of a new family, but rather for their ability to labor. And I think this whole story is a lot more twisted than this simple and seemingly well-intended narrative. The children were told, your parents are not your parents. Your life begins when you are chosen. Do either of you have any sense of how far back your ancestries go in New York? Have you ever? Yeah, I mean, mine came in the 1920s from Ireland, from Northern Ireland. Uh, mine about the same, 19, early 1900s. My dad was an incubator baby in Coney Island. He was on display. They had just invented the incubator. <laughs> he was. <laughs> you could literally tell me anything, I believe. No, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. I thank you for joining me. And do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And it seems like the constr and it seems like the control and it seems like the power structure in place. And here real quick I'm just on a side tangent and I'm looking at Balboa Park, California Tower in San Diego, California. One of the most outstanding examples of Spanish Baroque in North America. Initial construction, 1914. And here she is. And we can have a little look at the people down here in comparison. And a real mind blower. A beautiful tower next to a dome. Our favorite combination. And I'm going to thank a kind Patreon, Holly, for piquing my interest in this area. And while we're talking about California, I recently saw a fascinating video, and I'll have to dig into my watch history, talking about how the cedars of Lebanon may not have been in the Middle East. And it talks about these great and glorious trees of cedar, pine type of tree. And yet we see no such massive, glorious trees as depicted in the Bible. But where we do see such trees are in California. And we've talked about whether the Americas may have been the Holy Land in past videos. But if there were a forest of massive trees, California is where we would find them. And if we were to rearrange our 
idea of the Middle East in America, then this particular channel proposed that Utah would be the Holy Land. And just a theory, but I thought it was worth sharing.